Uh, our two speakers in the balance of the afternoon follow a similar theme, Drs. Plummer and Fauci. Dr. Plummer, I knew for many years as a medical resident and trainee here at the University of Toronto, and as a young staff person in 2003 when they had the SARS epidemic, which had a big effect on Toronto. Dr. Plummer is a, is a native of Manitoba. He came on faculty in 1984. For many years, 17, he was affiliated with Nairobi. And through the, uh, the story he's going to tell us on the National Microbiology Lab, he's going to tell us how he played a guiding leadership role in the transformation of our own Canadian Institute to an internationally recognized center in global pandemics. He's the winner of a Canada Gairdner Whiteman Award. And a Whiteman Award is awarded to a Canadian who has demonstrated leadership in medicine and medical science. He's had many recognitions, the Order of Canada. 2007, he was CIHR Researcher of the Year. Today, he's gonna to share his story of the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, which put Canada on the map in global pandemics. Dr. Palmer. Uh, I'd like to uh, echo my uh, fellow laureates' uh, thanks to the Gardner Foundation for the recognition and my pleasure at being here today. Um, my talk's going to be a little bit different than the others. First of all, it's not going to be about CRISPR-Cas. Uh, it's going to be about uh, public health innovations coming out of the National Microbiology Lab. And also, it's not going to mainly be about my research. It's going to be about uh, innovations that have come out of the National Microbiology Lab over the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. So I'll start with a little bit of a primer on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. Emerging infections are those that are new or newly d discovered in humans, and they mainly come from animals, and you can see a short list of them there. Infections re-emerge when old microbial foes acquire new weapons through genetic exchange or mutation such as resistance to drugs or vaccines <clears throat> or escape from human immune defenses. This is a non-comprehensive list of uh, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases over my career. And if you look down the list, you'll see um, many familiar and frightening, uh, frightening infections. So Ebola virus wasn't known when I finished medical school. Uh, HIV-1, which I spent most of my career uh, studying, uh, wasn't known about then. And Zika virus is the latest in, uh, in this list. Are infectious disease threats increasing? Uh, probably yes. I think Dr. Fauci would agree with that. Uh, there have been over 35 plus new diseases over the past 40 years, and there's going to be more. Of all microbial species that are thought to exist, we've only characterized about 1%. And the remaining 99% represent the constant source of new threats. And once again, most infections come from animals, and organisms mutate in response to things that we do, such as dr uh, use drugs, uh, vet develop vaccines, disinfectants, and so on. Why is this happening? Uh, ecologic changes, uh, human demographic and behavioral changes, globalization, rapid growth in technology, the things that we do uh, in our healthcare system help drive this. Uh, my, microbes adapt and change, in fact, they have sex lives, uh, and gaps in our public health programs and infrastructure. So what do we do about this, these threats? Well, in, uh, to paraphrase our, uh, our national treasure, Wayne Gretzky, you have to anticipate where the puck is gonna be, not try to chase the puck. And uh, I call this the Katrina lesson, uh, after the, uh, the devastating hurricane experienced by New Orleans. You can't build the levee after the hurricane has happened. You have to have the levee ready ahead of time. And that's what Canada did to respond to these emerging infectious disease um, threats in building the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg, uh, which opened in uh, 1999. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic facility. It was built as a cathedral to science, and uh, it is. And it remains today uh, one of the best labs in the world. It was built to be uh, the best in the world when it opened. So a few facts about the National Microbiology Lab. It was announced in 1987, and there's an interesting backstory here. 
The reason it was awarded to Winnipeg, or one of the reasons, uh, was that uh, Winnipeg had lost an aircraft maintenance contract to a Montreal firm, uh, which in the Winnipeg bid was perceived by many in, in Manitoba and many across the West to be, uh, to be a better bid. Uh, construction began in 1992 after the design team visited something like 65 laboratories around the world to get the best ideas in design of labs. And they designed a uh, fantastic facility, which, uh, as I said, remains world class to this day. It officially opened in 1999 and contains the only uh, two level four laboratories in Canada. Uh, it's the first facility in the world with uh, human and animal class four laboratories. So the National Microbiology Laboratory has a level four lab, as does the Canadian Food Inspection Agency Laboratory. And that's proven very advantageous to bring the agriculture and uh, human health fields together. Uh, the, most of the laboratory space in the building is not level four, even though it's called a level four lab it, by, my, by many people. That only makes up about 4% of the lab uh, space in the building. And this is level four labs, the kind of labs where people wear these space suits uh, connected to breathing air, uh, and the kind of viruses that uh, scientists work on there are things like Ebola, Nipah virus, Marburg virus. The NML has uh, every bad virus known to, to humanity except for smallpox. So here's some important public health innovations that have come out of the NML um, since it opened in 1999. Uh, the first innovation I'm gonna talk about, whoops, can't get this right is rapid systems for rapid detection and alerting of infectious diseases. This is born out of SARS in 2003. So when SARS happened, as a public health system in Canada, we had no way of communicating between jurisdictions, from the federal level to the provincial level down to public health units. That was a major gap in our ability to respond effectively. So what we, in, uh, Obviously, the speed of detection and alerting uh, is correlated very closely with the speed of response and the length of time it, it takes to put in place uh, mitigation strategies. And prior to what we put in place, uh, uh, countries were reporting um, diseases to WHO over the course of weeks rather than a few hours or a few days. So we developed what we call Canadian Network for Public Health Intelligence, which is an advanced computer uh, based technology that is used for all emerging infectious diseases. Uh, the background is that it's an innovative scientific public health informatics platform developed and managed by the NML. It includes technologies for collaboration, surveillance, alerting, knowledge management, lab systems, and event management. And it supports a large number of federal, provincial, and territorial public health provincials professionals in the human, animal, and environmental health domains. And it's used daily. Uh, I, on my BlackBerry, we still use Blackberries in the federal government, I, uh, I get alerts daily about what's going on across the country. It's a recognized and tr trusted platform that provides uh, key foundational infrastructure for public health surveillance in Canada. And I can't, uh, it respects, uh, respects jurisdictions, which if you ever worked in the Canadian uh, federal government or you ever worked in a federation, respecting jurisdictions is extremely important if you want to stay out of trouble. So this system can take data, either automated data feeds or manual uh, data from many different uh, sources, from hospitals, from epidemiologists, from environmental specialists, laboratories, physicians. We in fact use uh, our flu watch uh, influenza surveillance system is based on a sentinel surveillance system uh, through, uh, through index physicians. Uh, on the internet in a, what we call the SINFI cloud, uh, this data is uh, pulled together and then turned into integrated intelligence. And that in intelligence might be maps, uh, tables, uh, charts, reports, and notification. Uh, one of the key elements of SINFI is the alerting system. And, uh, it's most commonly used for alerting about foodborne outbreaks. And when we started with this, the alerts were primarily going from the federal level up to the provinces, uh, then on to uh, local public health. Now, uh, the 
alerts are uh, bi-directional, and most of the alerts actually originate in provinces, and the alerts amount to the fact is, hey, we're seeing this, what are you seeing? Are you seeing anything similar? Um, I would, I uh, forgot to mention that uh, every public health unit in Canada now is on this system. Uh, so it's a very, very powerful public health tool. And here's uh, how the system works in, for uh, in, enteric surveillance. So on your right is a pulse field gel electrophoresis uh, TIF file. And uh, it's a digest of uh, the bacterial genome. And uh, what ends up being produced is something that looks like a barcode. And when barcodes uh, match, the organisms tend to have the same, or almost certainly have the same source and are, are very, very closely related. Then over SINFI, we use a program called Bionumerics to organize this data, as you see here. And this is an example of a listeria outbreak that we had in 2008, in which uh, you can see in red uh, the patients that had the, that had the epidemic strain. And the, the background uh, shown in blue are non-outbreak strains that were occurring at the same time, because listeria occurs all the time, not necessarily in, uh, in epidemics. So using this system, we were able to detect uh, this epidemic when there were eight cases spread across Canada and in multiple provinces. If we hadn't had this system, we may never have identified this. And ha being able to detect it when there's eight cases and identifying a food source allowed the prevention of many, many cases and many deaths as well. The second innovation is about rapid containment. Uh, at source, sending the lab to the specimen rather than uh, sending a specimen to the lab. So this has an interesting backstory as well. So in, in 2001, at the height of the uh, anthrax scares, a uh, suspicious envelope with powder in it was opened in a, um, a New Brunswick office at a hospital. And the, the office shared its ventilation system with the ICU and the oncology units. So there was some urgency to figure out what was in there. And the only way it could be done at the time was for a specimen to be tested by the NML. And we tried for several days to get a specimen to Winnipeg, and uh, it wouldn't happen uh, because of dif difficulties in transportation. So what we decided to do on a Saturday morning was that we would send a team with equipment to the specimen to get it tested as fast as we could. So over the course of three hours, we brought in people from home. Uh, one person had to get a babysitter because his wife was at work. Uh, put, pulled together the uh, equipment that was required for testing for uh, their anthrax genome, and then chartered a plane um, out of Winnipeg and had them on, on, uh, on the way to New Brunswick in three hours. I'm still amazed that I was able to call up the charter company and, uh, and get a plane without any authorization at all. I didn't even give them my credit card. They just rented me a plane for $25,000 on my word. Uh, so we decided after that that we needed this capability uh, on, uh, on a full-time basis, not to make it up as you go along. And so we put together this ability to uh, with portable class three units that allow you to work safely with uh, high-risk pathogens. Uh, so this is what it looks like in the field. Uh, this is from a, um, an outbreak in, uh, Ebola outbreak in DRC in, uh, I think it was 2007. So the heart of the technology is uh, this machine here, which is sort of being circled by the mouse, uh, a smart cycler, which allows you to test for multiple different things at one time or uh, multiple uh, specimens for the same thing. It's very rugged. It could be dropped off the back of a truck, and that's a bit happened to it a few times. It could be run off a truck battery, uh, so you don't need a constant source of power, which is a problem where most of these uh, outbreaks occur. Uh, it's also small, so it can fit on a small airplane. And this is from a, um, a Marburg outbreak in uh, Angola. Uh, so it, m many of the places where these outbreaks occur are remote and don't have a major airport, so you ha have to be able to transport things in small planes. And this is what the current setup looks like in uh, operating in uh, Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2007. But during that outbreak, uh, we were initially in the hospital, but they needed the space for something else, so they kicked us out. So what we did was to build a lab with local labor uh, and local materials. And this was uh, organized by Medicine Sans Frontier. It cost us about $250 to get this lab built. 
And uh, this is what it looked like in the end. And we had a perfectly, perfectly functional laboratory in the field with uh, adequate protection for the workers and adequate disposal of infected materials. So this has now become a standard operating procedure for the World Health Organization and the uh, and Medicine Sans Frontier for responding to these outbreaks. And I'm very proud to say that the NML had uh, four separate lab teams in the field during um, most of the uh, recent Ebola outbreak in, uh, in West Africa. Third innovation I want to talk to you about is using viruses to fight viruses. And this is about viral hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, they are scary viruses, uh, such as Ebola, Marburg, its close cousin, Blasa fever, which is a big problem in West Africa, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, and Machupa, and there, there are many others. Uh, why are they so feared? Well, they're zoonotic. Uh, they have very high mortality. And until recently, there was no treatment, no vaccines, and they were uh, a worry as uh, potential bioterrorism agents. So this is a, the backstory here is that the scientists at the NML were interested in exploring the pathogenicity of the Ebola glycoprotein. It was a hypothesis that the Ebola glycoprotein was responsible for much of the disease caused by Ebola. And so what they decided to do is to use vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a cattle pathogen, to, um, to deliver the Ebola glycoprotein gene uh, to animals. Uh, to try to investigate the pathogenesis. But when it came to challenge these animals with Ebola, what they found was the animals were protected. Uh, they didn't get infected, and none of them got infected. So essentially what they'd done is develop an Ebola vaccine. Uh, they went on to study this in non-human primates and were able to show that it could protect 100% of non-human primates against Ebola challenge with this vaccine. And that it was also effective post-exposure, so up to 72 hours after after exposure to Ebola, the vaccine still had some efficacy. In that instance, it's probably not acting like a true vaccine. It may be acting as a booster of innate immunity, or maybe it's acting like a drug and soaking up, uh, soaking up the Ebola um, receptors. Uh, so the, all of the people who were involved in this project uh, left the NML uh, about uh, 2008 or so. Uh, Dr. Fauci stole one of them to Montana. Uh, not that I, not that I'm resentful. Uh, we, um, but we pushed ahead with the work, uh, and we had to go back to uh, kind of square one because all of this work had been done w essentially with laboratory re reagents, and it wasn't suitable for use in humans. So we had to go back and repeat all the work w under GMP conditions. Uh, but it so happened that. Um, we had uh, clinical grade material ready at the time the outbreak in uh, West Africa happened. And uh, a very unique, uh, well not so unique, uh, a very innovative uh, vaccination strategy was used uh, whereby uh, people who were secondary uh, exposures to uh, a, uh, an index case of Ebola were vaccinated with this vaccine. And 100% uh, of them were protected against uh, Ebola. There's also the potential in the future that this might be used uh, for post-exposure vaccination, as has been done with rabies. And uh, this was, the, I think, the, the first uh, Ebola vaccine to get uh, to phase three trials and uh, highly successful. The other trials didn't really get going in time uh, before the uh, outbreak uh, uh, died out. Uh, so the, this is a pretty major advance uh, for in public health in general, but particularly for the NML in Canada. There's lots of future uh, concerns and, and future development needed. We don't know what the adverse effects long term of these, uh, these vectors are. Uh, we don't know the durability of the immunity, the need uh, to study that. And this, because it's a livestock pathogen, we don't know what the impact might be on uh, livestock and wildlife species. The fourth innovation is monoclonal treatment for Ebola virus infection. Um, it had proven very difficult uh, for some reason to develop neutralizing monoclonal antibodies uh, to Ebola over many years. Many people had tried. But more or less simultaneously at the NML and at USAMRI, the US Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Disease, uh, neutralizing monoclonals were, uh, de were developed for the first time. 
Uh, and one of the scientists at the NML had the idea of trying to pool the best of these neutralizing monoclonals uh, and determine uh, if they might have better efficacy as a, as a pool of uh, monoclonals rather than individual monoclonals. So what ended up being the best combination is a combination of two monoclonals developed at the NML and one from, one from USAMRIN. And that has gone into, uh, into uh, people now uh, with seemingly great effect. And uh, this gives us a new therapeutic option for, for Ebola, whereas we had very little before. And monoclonal antibodies have been around since 75, and, but they're gradually uh, getting more and more into clinical development for things like cancer, inflammatory diseases, uh, infections, or immunologic disorders. So uh, this won't be the last uh, monoclonal antibody that goes into the clinic. Uh, the fifth story I want to tell you is about using high throughput, mach throughput machines to understand uh, genetics. And this looks at H1N1 from the 2009. And this is how I got involved in this, uh, uh, this pandemic. So this is April 17, 2009, a Friday night. I was watching uh, Philadelphia Flyers play somebody else. I don't remember who it was. And uh, looking at my Blackberry because the hockey game wasn't that really that very interesting. So uh, this is an email from my counterpart at the uh, Mexican uh, National Public Health Laboratory. And she was asking for help because they were experiencing an outbreak of a severe respiratory illness in, in um, Mexico City with uh, uh, quite a few deaths. And they were very worried about this. Uh, and they couldn't figure out what it was. They tested for influenza and didn't really find anything. Um, and because of our experience in dealing with SARS, uh, they came to us first. We had a teleconference with them the next day to try to figure out what we might be able to help them with. And the best help we could offer at that point was to get specimens from Mexico and test them uh, for everything we could think of. But about the same day that we were having this conference call, the CDC of the U.S. reported the uh, detection of a, a new uh, influenza A, pre not previously seen before, which came to be known as H1N1 swine. And so when we finally got specimens from Mexico a few days later, we were able to rapidly determine that what was, what was being seen in Mexico City was the same as what was happening in, uh, in California. And about uh, the uh, 23rd of April, uh, we got a phone call from Nova Scotia saying that they had some untypable influenza A in, in Nova Scotia from a, uh, a school uh, class that had visited Mexico. Uh, so by that time, we knew pretty much that we had a pandemic. We had it in Mexico, we had it in California, and we had it in Canada. Uh, that's what the virus looks like. It looks like any other influenza virus. Uh, when we did, uh, we did genome sequencing of this virus and basically we showed that uh, it clustered, the Mexican virus clustered very closely with the California virus and later we did uh, the Canadian viruses as well. Uh, it's an interesting virus, uh, it kind of fooled everybody. It's a, um, a reassortment H1N1 and it has uh, genes of North American human origin, North American swine origin, Eurasian swine origin, and North American avian or origin. Uh, Everybody had been preparing for a, a, an influenza pandemic, but they'd all been looking at, at Asia, as had we, as the possible source, of, the likely source of the next pandemic. We didn't think that it would arise in Mexico, as it probably did in this case. So we had some interesting experiences during this, uh, during this uh, event. Uh, one evening I was in Ottawa, and I got a phone call from uh, the Deputy Minister of Health in, um, in Mexico, asking if we would test some more specimens. And I said, yes, yes, we'd be glad to. And he said, okay, we're sending a plane to Winnipeg. Uh, and it turned out it was the Mexican president's plane, that he uh, lent his plane to the public health laboratory to, to fly specimens to Winnipeg. So this uh, created a great stir in the higher levels of the Canadian government. The Ministry of Defense had to be informed because this was a uh, you know, an unauthorized flight, essentially. We wanted to be sure they didn't get shot down. And when they fi finally landed in Winnipeg at 2 o'clock in the morning, a uh, bleary-eyed uh, Mexican lab technician got off the plane with the specimens, and he was still wearing his lab coat. 
the president of Mexico had actually supervised uh, the loading of the specimens. And the Mexican lab was under such pressure at that point, um, they had staff from the uh, president's office in the lab on a daily basis demanding results. Uh, and they couldn't do it at, uh, at the speed that the, pre that the president wanted. Uh, so what we did later, the next time the Mexican president's uh, plane came in, uh, we loaded five people on the plane and sent them to Mexico City to help Mexico get its testing capacity uh, increased, and which they did in a re remarkable period of time. Over a period of about five days, per they helped Mexico purchase genetic analyzers and other equipment and got their throughput uh, for flu testing up from about 20 a day to 1,000 a day. And the, the leader of that team, a woman called Lute Strower, got invited to the Mexican president's house for dinner uh, as a re reward. Uh, the last innovation, and this, this touches on my own research, is uh, using systems biology to understand infectious diseases and hopefully find solutions for the HIV pandemic. Uh, this is a slide um, from a study that we did a long time ago, uh, looking at the uh, rate of uh, survival in HIV serial negative sex workers who were constantly exposed to HIV. And what you see is over the first uh, the first couple of years, first three years, I guess, of uh, follow-up in this study, uh, over 50% of women seroconverted to HIV. But gradually, the rates of seroconversion become less and less and less until you reach a rather pronounced plateau. And we were able to show that uh, this wasn't a result of an asymptotic decay to zero through mathematical modeling, and it wasn't a result of safer sexual behaviors or other potential things. And about 10% of highly exposed sex workers uh, appear to be resistant to some biologic uh, uh, mechanism to HIV. Uh, this is a tough problem to study, because uh, you think about the interaction of a virus, any virus, but particularly HIV, with the immune system uh, and the, the host in general, it's very complex. So you have adaptive immunity, innate immunity, human immunity, cellular immunity. Uh, and understanding this whole system by looking at one thing at a time is never going to give you the whole picture. Uh, by the way, a graduate student of mine spent most of his PhD uh, working on this uh, slide. <laughs> so what we decided to do was uh, to, um, to take a, uh, uh, a broader approach, uh, and we did some uh, gene expression profiling in our HIV-resistant women, comparing them to HIV-negative women. And what we saw was a very, very interesting clustering of uh, the gene expression of HIV-resistant women, shown in green here, uh, compared to the HIV-negative women. And what was also interesting was that the genes and uh, the expression of many genes and many pathways in these women was down-regulated compared to controls, particularly those of the immune system, which was something we weren't expect expecting at, at all. What we went on later to f show is that uh, these women have kind of a quiescent immune system, uh, that uh, uh, their immune systems are at baseline uh, rather quiet compared to ordinary people. But if you challenge them with recall antigens, whether that's flu or Canada or anything else, they appear to have quite a normal response, so they're not immunosuppressed. And we're trying to figure out why, uh, why they have this uh, immunocoiescent phenotype. Um, and we're continuing that work. Uh, another interesting, unexpected finding was another set of genes that were downregulated was the uh, insulin signaling pathway. So women, and they clustered together once again, our resistant women had lower expression of uh, many genes of the insulin signaling pathway compared to, uh, compared to HIV negative women. Uh, in, interesting, there, all, all genes were downregulated except for the gene DPP4, which is also a, a cell service marker, and it's CD something or other. I forget uh, I get what, which numerical designation it has. So this pattern of gene expression is very similar to what's seen in type 2 diabetes, but these women aren't diabetic. So how this ties in with the whole phenomena of immune coalescence and uh, uh, resistance to infection, I'm not sure. So the next step in, uh, in this project is uh, we feel that uh, bioinformatics as it exists now has yielded limited insights into the basis for resistance to HIV and, and other complex data problems. 
And in collaboration with a machine learning company, we're trying to explore the utility of artificial intelligence for understanding these kind of complex data. So I know this, this kind of data is way beyond my ability to comprehend it in any sensible way. So I'll conclude there uh, by saying that microbial threats are growing and ever-changing, so I'm not worried about uh, having uh, no work to do. Uh, the National Microbiology Laboratory has become a key global institution in innovation for response to emerging infectious diseases. And the importance and achievements of the NML are relatively unknown by Canadians, which is why I'm crossing the country giving this talk. And thank God this is the last time I'm giving it. Um, Alice, thank you for your attention.